you're looking at it on your phone, make the pages sound with your mouth. <laughs> silent. I don't know, the, what, there's something about that sound of pages turning when I very first stepped to the pulpit. It's, it's, it's almost like a chainsaw revving for me. Uh, let's get this thing started. Let's work. Um, well, Happy New Year. I haven't seen a lot of you since last year. It's a really bad joke. It's got old quick. Um, <laughs> for the next eight weeks, I'm going to be going through the Psalm, the psalm uh, chapter 119. It's the word psalm. Uh, psalm 119 is very interesting song. The psalm has 22 stanzas. Each one uh, represented by a letter from the Hebrew alphabet. And each stanza, each eight verses, begins with that letter which corresponds to that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And they're in order. It's really interesting. Every verse in some way, shape, or form points to God's law, to God's word, to scripture. In some way, shape, or form, every single verse in this chapter is pointing to what God has said. You know, some people have a word for the year uh, some people have a thought that they study for a year or something maybe God is working on them for a certain amount of time. Uh, for me, personally, I believe that what God has impressed upon my mind to focus on is, thus saith the Lord. God's word. What does he say? Now, that makes sense for me because I'm a preacher, right? Obviously. I'm supposed to preach the word. Uh, minimize my opinions and bring forth and exalt what God has said. That's what's important. That's what people need to hear. I love this psalm. I love the different angles and the different pictures and the different viewpoints and different perspectives. It goes from God to the person reading, God to the world. The person looking at the world, looking at God, uh, comes from the third person, second, first. It's, it's in all these different tenses, all these different perspectives. Over and over and over again, speaking of God's word, his nature, who we are, its effect on us and the world around us, what the wise do and what the foolish don't. Many different examples of life through the word are given in this chapter. Now, I'm not going to exactly exegete the text and go over every single verse, every single line. I'll have a little something to say. But more, I would like to think about the structure of it and think about how the themes go together in these passages. And to do that, I want to consider the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, for every letter, like I said, every letter is, begins every eight verses. It goes through, there's 176 verses. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet is uh, fascinating. I've been studying the Hebrew language for about 11 years now, about five years into my conversion um, of being saved and studying the word. I got really interested in Hebrew, and I've been studying it ever since and doing my own research and reading many good books about the Hebrew language. And I love, I love listening to Orthodox rabbis um, talk about the Hebrew language. Um, one particular rabbi that I've been reading a book by him, Rabbi Yitzhak Ibrahim, he um, speaks about the Hebrew alphabet and the Hebrew language and how every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet is not just a letter with a sound, but it is also a picture. It's also a number. Um, some of the Hebrew letters are actually constructed from other Hebrew letters. Um, the LF, or LF, LF, 
Alep, depending on whether it's ancient Hebrew or modern Hebrew or uh, Bronze Age Hebrew, the Hebrew has changed and evolved over the centuries. The Aleph, um, where the Greek gets alpha from, um, has this interesting construction. When you look at the Hebrew letter, it's actually uh, a yod on top and a yod on bottom and then a slanted vav. It's, it's two letters. It's two other letters of the Hebrew alphabet constructed to make this symbol. And what's really interesting is that the ancient Hebrew, the picture uh, looked more like the head of an ox or the head of a bull. Um, as time progressed and the, the language evolved, this is what it's come to be. Uh, it, it's, obviously, it stands for the number one. Uh, it means Lord, leader. It's, it also means an ox. Um, it means strength. It means strong. Uh, the Yod above and the Yod below, this is something that when, uh, uh, little kids are taught in Hebrew school. They're taught that when you look at the Aleph, you think of God as the Yod above and man as the Yod below. And the Vav that is slanted in between is the law which connects the two. In the letter, in the symbol and picture of the letter, you have God above, man below, and they are connected by God's word. Very interesting. Aleph uh, starts a lot of um, familiar words in Hebrew. Adam, Adam begins with an Aleph. Abba, father. Abba is actually a construction of the Aleph and the Beth or the Bet. This idea of Aleph, the leader, the Lord, strength, um, it's so prominent in Hebrew culture that the majority of Hebrew names begin with it, uh, with the Aleph. The second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Beth or Beth, you see there, it's, it represents a tent or a house or the soul or life. It's actually the very first word of the Hebrew Bible, the very first word of the Old Testament, in. Beth actually begins the Hebrew word for in, and it's this idea of within something. Now, if you look at the, the symbol, it's this, it almost looks like a reverse C, and then there's that dot. And the picture of it is within, this idea of a tent and a house. It's almost like if you were to look at someone that was to hollow out a cave in the side of a mountain, and then they were to get in it, you're looking at the side view of how they've hollowed something out, and then they're within it. The idea is within, so when the Hebrew Bible starts in the beginning, it's literally within the beginning, inside, in the tent, in the house of the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so it makes sense that when we, the Hebrew word for father, Abba, the combination of the Aleph, and the bet is the idea of the leader or the Lord of the house. So in the New Testament, in, in Christianity, we teach that fathers are to be the head of the household. Well, the Hebrew language has been saying this for centuries, for millennia. In the very word for father is the idea of leader and house. And then there we have Gimel, the, the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Obviously, it's a three. Now, not all the letters go one, two, three, four, five. They begin to get bigger and bigger as the, the alphabet goes along. And, of course, we get that word alphabet. Alephbet is what, is what Hebrews call the alphabet. Alephbet, it's the first two letters. But you go to Gimel. Um, what's interesting about the Gimel is it kind of looks like a high heel. Does anybody else see that, or is it just me? <laughs> it looks like a boot to me. Now, some have said that, I mean, if you slant it more, I've seen it written in other ways, and also some write the gamel, or they, they show it with the crown on top of its head. And it's hunched forward like a camel, which is interesting because the Hebrew word uh, gamal is camel, and then there's gimel, which is to give, and then gimel, which is to take or to stop from giving. Um, the letter itself represents progress, walking, and doing good work, and a camel has this idea of something that can walk a great distance and is used for work and labor. To give, gimel or, gimel, or to stop giving, 
is to do good. There's also this picture that, that's also, I was talking about little kids in Hebrew school, and they're taught about the letter Gamel. Like, we tell our kids about the word see, and we say cat, and we say cook, and we say cot, and you know, we say cry. We show them all these pictures of what it can represent, and little Hebrew boys and girls are taught about Gamel, about the idea of a person running to do good. That's kind of another picture of it, you think, If this line going down is the person, that little thing is their foot going forward. They're moving forward. It's the idea of progress, the idea of doing good, and not just doing good, but running to do good. And so one of the stories that's told is the idea that a rich man has been given his riches that he might run and take care of the poor to do good, to do well with what you've been given. Interesting. Also, uh, excuse me, the idea of the gamel is also speaking of a reward and punishment that those who do good are rewarded with good and those who do bad are rewarded with bad. So we speak of the leader of the house and of doing good. And so keep those things in mind because you might see those themes show up in these 24 verses. Psalm chapter 119, verse 1, Aleph. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Now, what I'm reading might not match uh, the pages in front of you. Um, For this study, I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Um, It's one of the most common translations, easy to understand. I really love this idea of blessing being repeated twice. It's important. It's important when things are repeated. And he begins the psalm, the song begins with a repeat. So pay close attention. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. He says those whose ways are blameless, he defines the ones whose ways are blameless. This is the blameless one, the one who walks according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart, that their inmost being is going after his statutes, his law. What he says, what he's decreed, his judgments. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. Notice that in verse 3. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. It's a judgment from God saying to follow your own way is wrong. To go your own way, this is a phrase that's used so often in Scripture when people go their own way. It's, it's a, a saying, a metaphor of a person that has forsaken the Lord. They go their own way. He says, they do do no wrong, but they follow his ways, the one who loves the law, the one who seeks after God with their heart through his statutes. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. Yet, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. There's this idea in the Aleph, in this this first four verses of it, I'll read the next four here in a second, that the idea of God leading. He is strong, he is leader, just as the Aleph represents. But notice that That the Aleph, it begins the word for blessed. That your blessing is connected to you being led by the Lord. And how are you led? It's through his word. It's through his law. It's through his precepts, his statutes. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. These words, decrees, commands. There's this admission, confession that you are strong. You are leader, Lord. Give me your command. I should follow you. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. This last line in this stanza, do not utterly forsake me, is an admission that God has the power to forsake you. And that that, it's implied that that would be a bad thing. That you don't want him to forsake you. And he's pleading, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. I need you to be faithful to me, is what he's saying. He says, you'll be faithful to me. Please change me. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Make me like you, is what he's saying. Don't forsake me. Uphold me. I'll praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. In verse 9, Beth, or Beth, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. 
There's the speaking of the inward part here. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? How can they find within themselves what is in the young person that they could keep themselves pure? He says this, I seek you with all my heart, my inmost being. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The idea of purity within, the idea of seeking with all the heart, the idea of the bet, the house, the within, the soul, the life, that inner portion, that that is where it matters. I've hidden, so I've hidden your word there. And you think of that picture of the, the, the bet with, with that dot in the middle. You are that dot that, you are to, that, that you're supposed to be within God, but then it's also this picture of you being that house, that tent, and God's word being in you. And so he says, I've hidden your word in my heart. I've brought it within. Just as you created everything in the beginning, so your word is in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I I try to use my lips to do what your lips do. I want to be like you. I fill my lips with what comes from yours. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Now you usually don't dance out in the street with great riches. That's usually something that you do within your own home, with your family, something you do within. Now great riches themselves aren't bad. It's the lust and the greed for great riches that's the source of all evil in this world. But this idea of God blessing you and giving you good things in life, the scripture says that God is the one that gives us all things richly to enjoy. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Listen to these these words about being within. I meditate, that's something within, in your mind to continually think, but also in your mouth under your breath to mutter and to speak and to memorize. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees, I will not neglect your word. I believe that that is the number one problem that is plaguing many people in the church is neglecting God's word. It's awful hard to have strength when you haven't eaten for a long time. Anyone here ever fasted before? You ever gone on a fast for like three days? Anyone ever done like a seven-day fast? Anyone ever done a 12-day fast? How about 40 Big 4-0. Anybody ever done a 40-day fast? Whew. That's a tough one. How weak were you after going three days? My uh, brother-in-law, we like to make fun of him. We say this about me, too. We both get hangry. That means that we're angry when we're hungry. We don't have strength of character when we haven't eaten. Right? <laughs> and there's something about neglecting God's word that is so detrimental to the life of a Christian. I want to encourage you. I want to, I want to uh, increase your faith in God's word that you can trust God's word, that you must eat and feed your soul with God's word. Listen, there, there are some of you that have made excuses like, well, I don't even remember what I read. Do you remember what you had for breakfast seven months ago? It still gave you nutrition though, didn't it? Read God's word. Quit making excuses. Every day, feed yourself the word of God. Do not neglect it. It's like neglecting good food when you need strength to work. Your soul, your spirit needs strength to work in the word of God. The scriptures say, they say in the New Testament that we are to crave, crave pure spiritual milk like newborn babies. Speaking of the word of God, it's pure spiritual milk for our souls, nourishment for us. Jesus says in John chapter 6, he says that that my words are spirit and life. If you want life in the spirit and you want spiritual strength for life in this world, you you must feed on the words of Jesus. You must obey his commands and his laws. Hide them in your heart. Keep yourself from sin. Verse 17, Gamal, be good to your servant while I live. 
the, the very first word, gemel, it's, it's that word itself, or gimel, it's the idea of doing good, the rich who runs to do good to the poor, the one who has, that gives to the one who has not. Be good to your servant while I live. This, this cry in this stanza at the very beginning is saying, you are the one that possesses good. I am your servant. Please be good to me. Give to me. The scriptures declare this idea of gemel all over the place, but it's the most important when it comes to love. And we can, we can show this in the New Testament in John 3.16. Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave the greatest good, the greatest good that we see in families are parents that give to their children. Now think about it. Think about it. With parents, um, say a mother and a child, in that relationship, who does all the giving? It's the mother, obviously. From birth, the mother gives and gives. She gives of her body, gives of her time, gives of her stress, gives of her weariness, and gives. Even when she's strong and when she's weak, she continues to give, give, give that the ch- child might have life. At least a good mother does. And one would say that the mother is more loving than the child. Now, a child will grow in love to love their mother in a way that's different from the love of the mother. But the mother's love, we would say, is far stronger, far greater because of how she gives. And this cry, be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word, that I need you to be good to me. I need you to bless me. Please give me life through your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I'm a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. The theme in this stanza is the idea of receiving something that I do not have myself. He says, open my eyes. I can't do it on my own. Do not hide your commands from me because you're the one that can reveal them. My soul is consumed with longing. Why would I long? Because it's something that I don't have of myself. I need it to be given to me. And God is gracious and he's given us his word. God is gracious and he's given us his word. That's, that gets me to wanting to dance when I think about what God has given us, that he's chosen to speak to us. The scripture says that God at different times and in various ways spoke to us through the prophets of old. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. Through Jesus Christ, the word of God has been revealed to us. Through Jesus Christ, we've been given understanding. The book of Luke, chapter 24, tells us that Jesus Christ opened the disciples' eyes that they might understand the scriptures. It is through Christ Jesus that the veil is removed. See, up until this day, there's a veil hiding our eyes from understanding what the law says. But in Christ, the veil is removed. There's freedom through the Spirit of Christ. Open our eyes. You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep your statutes. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Not only does your word bring me joy, but your word makes me wise, gives me strength and hope, and counsels me when things are hard. He's got these different things in this last part of the stanza. You rebuke the arrogant, the accursed, the scorn and contempt from them, the rulers that slander. He says, though men treat me this way, I find joy in your word. Though people in this world may be evil and wicked all around me, I am counseled by your law. I look to you, Lord, please speak to me. These passages in this psalm speak to the leadership of God and how God's word ought to be hidden in our hearts that we are to take what he's given us and bring it within ourselves that it might become a part of us and then we're to walk them out and to see that there are those that don't have that example. But nevertheless, even though others might go against God's word, we walk in it. We gamel, we do good. We give. Your statutes are my delight. They're my counselors. And keep in mind the Aleph and the Beth and the gamel as I go into this next passage. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Jesus Christ 
is the Word incarnate. He is the Word made flesh. The Word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the expression and the physical embodiment of the invisible God. God's way of showing himself to us. Jesus says that all who have seen me have seen the Father. John chapter 14, in verse 23, listen to what Jesus says. He's replying to one of his disciples. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And my Abba, my Father, will love them, and we will come to them and make our booth with them. Their bet, a beth, Abba will come and make his home with you. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. When we speak of obedience and we speak about obeying the word, we talk about walking. Do we walk the talk? You talk the talk, do you walk the walk? In these two verses, the Aleph, Beth, and Gamal are present. The leader, the strong one, the ox, the bull, the strength, the authority, almighty God, the Father. He says, if you obey and walk in my teaching, is what he's saying. If you walk and do good by obeying my teaching, my Father will love you and we will come to you and make our home within you. These are the words of Jesus Christ. He encouraged his disciples several times in this chapter He commanded them, encouraged them, implored them, pleaded with them, obey my teachings, stay in my word, and I will live in you. Are you setting aside aside time in your day to focus on God's word, to bring it within your heart and your mind that God might live in your life in your soul. Jesus says this is the secret. Plainly tells us how it works. He says, you love me, obey my teaching, and I will live with you. I will make my home within you. Aleph, Beth, Gamal. It's a word song. It's praise to the Most High to obey His word. When you listen to God's word and then you do what it says, you show that you trust him. Now listen, when you do what someone says, just simply, when you do what someone says, you're showing trust that what they're saying is right. That's why it's so important for kids to honor your father and mother and obey them. Do you know, you young ones, if, you're, if, if you don't have a house of your own and you're living with your parents, the scripture considers you a child, even if you're 18, even if you're 20. I'm, just, I'm being biblical here. I just want to say this to you. The only command that is given to children in the New Testament church, obey your parents. Why? Why is it so important to obey your parents? They are the leaders of your house. To honor them is to have a good life. And also, it trains you and teaches you how to obey authority that you might know the real authority, which is God in heaven. It's to teach you, to discipline you. As you obey your parents, you're practicing obeying God. This is what he's called us to. You love your parents, right? Then obey them. And Jesus says to his disciples, well, if you love me, obey my teaching and we'll live together just as you live together with your parents. Christ says, the Father and I will come and make our home with you. See, Christ's teachings don't stray far away from what we can understand. He actually comes right where we're at and simply tells us the truth of who we are, who he is, and what life can be like if we live with him can be filled with joy. We can delight in his word. We can be counseled when we need hope. When things get hard, we don't have to suffer through it alone. For we're never alone. Christ is with us. Are you in his word? Are you setting time aside to be in God's word? Jesus said, 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall bear much fruit. You'll show that you are truly my disciples. If you remain in my teachings, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Several times in Scripture, from several places, he said to remain in his word, remain in his teaching. Are you doing that? I want to challenge you, church. Let's be a church of the book. Let's be a people of the word. Let us be those who proclaim the word of God that people might meet the God of the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand with me for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for scripture. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the many sayings and commands and precepts and judgments that teach us how to be wise, that give us joy and delight, that show us your blessings, that teach us about your character, your nature, that we might truly know who you are, that we might recognize you as you're moving in our lives. I know, Lord, that in the beginning, in that garden, and the scriptures teach us that the tempter came and he questioned the word of God. He said to Eve, has God really said? Your scriptures declare these are the words of the evil one, that he questions your word. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength to stand on your word, that your church would not be led astray by lies from the enemy, but that we would walk in the truth of God. Strengthen your church, Lord, in these evil days. Let us be a beacon of hope. Let us be a pillar in this community that upholds righteousness, integrity, and goodness. Let us run with all the blessings that we have. Let us run to the poor, to the downtrodden, to the ones who need help. Let us take what we have and help those who don't have anything. Make us a church that shows forth your word and your love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a familiar song. I want you to really think about this hymn. Sometimes we sing hymns and we know them and we just really think about what it is saying to take Jesus at his word, to trust thus saith the Lord. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and openly confessed him, I invite you to come now as we sing. Come forward. I've got elders over here at the sides of the church. You can come and speak to them or you can come up here and speak to me if you want to. I'd love to pray with you and talk to you about a commitment to the Lord. What does, what does it mean to obey Him? What does it mean to trust His Word? What does it mean to walk with Him? We'd like to guide you in those first steps. If you've never been baptized in water, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the water is ready. We have clothes and towels in the back. If you've never been baptized and you would like to show forth your faith and be baptized united with Christ in baptism, have your soul saved and your sins washed away. I invite you to come for baptism. If you're looking for a home church, you're looking for a place of ministry, a place where you can come regularly, be fed the word of God, worship with other believers, make some friends and find a place to serve and help people. We invite you, the elders and I and the church invites you to Bible Christian Church. If you're looking for a church to call your own, call your home, call your family, I invite you to come as we sing this morning.